Welcome to the board meeting for each room of Central School District for May 26th. Call a meeting to order, 7 p.m. Uh, tonight's meeting, uh, all board members are present uh, in person, except for uh, Ms. Curtin and Ms. Pugh will not be here this evening. And with that, please rise and join with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you, everyone. So our first order of business is to let hear from our student council from Plymouth High School. We have Katie and Ryan. Welcome, nice. And I will turn it over to you. Let's see. Um, good evening. So um, today we had a meeting after school to discuss our class and student council elections for the 2021-22 school year. And it looks like we're going to have a lot of people running for positions, way more than this year, for next year, which is great because they'll definitely be a busy one getting back to our normal events and traditions. Um, so the official election will be two weeks from today, and then we will have the results to share with everyone. Today we will discuss our final arrangements for the Columbian Awards Ceremony. We will be recording the ceremony next Wednesday, June 2nd, and we have a group of junior and seniors to be presenting for the virtual award show. The awards will then be given out to the winners in the following day. And that's all we have. Great. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Katie. A great night. You're welcome to stay on if you want, but I'm sure you have a homework, right? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Um, next order of business for the agenda is the approval of the draft minutes for the public hearing dated May 4th, 2021. Any revisions, comments on the minutes for the public hearing? Seeing none, any motion to approve those? Join and second, Jennifer. All those in favor? <clears throat> Next, we have the draft minutes for May 4th, uh, regular, regular meeting. Any comments or questions or revisions on the minutes? Seeing none, any motion to approve that? John, second. Mark, all those in favor? Approved. Well, the next thing on our item is the uh, board form. Um, just for the public, we did have to change the meeting format a little bit, so we're we're trying uh, a little bit different uh, agenda. Kind of uh, see how this one goes. It um, seems to go well last couple of meetings. So, with the board form, I'd uh, like to invite uh, Jennifer. Any comments at all? Okay. Michelle, anything? John, good. Mark, anything? Good. Joanne, anybody? Okay. Good. I am good. I will reserve any comments for the second public board or the second board forum later on as we get through our, our business tonight. And for the public forum, um, I will read the, uh, the public content. Residents, students, employees, and business representatives of East Greenwood Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. Members of the board do not directly respond to citizen concerns in the public forum. If a response is appropriate, the president or superintendent will contact the individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name, address, or affiliation to the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon free speech protections, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum does not need to be open form. The board president will conduct a forum for the orderly and efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which may be considered defamatory or stigmatizing or prohibited will be declared out of order. All comments should be limited. Nope. That's for our public comment, but we have our email set up. Um, and Linda, do we have any emails? There are no public comments. Okay. For our public, there is a second opportunity as you hear the rest of the agenda to um, submit any email comments um, to the board for reading. Their public forum members here. With that, I'll turn over to our superintendent for reports and presentations. Thank you, Mr. Bruno. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome, members of the Board of Education, our administrative team and those members of the community who are uh, participating in the live stream of our board meeting. Uh, tonight we have a special report uh, on an annual basis. Representatives of the leadership team at Quest Art Three BOCES come to present to our Board of Education. We are one of 23 component districts within the Quest Art, and we uh, have a great relationship with the Quest Art BOCES, and we also have a number of programs and services for students that we participate in through Questart, as well as administrative services. So at this point, I'm going to interview, uh, introduce uh, the Questart Deputy Superintendent, Harry Eginow, and the Chief Academic Officer, Anthony Tavey. 
Uh, Gladys Cruz could not be here tonight due to a personal matter. So Thank very you. good. Thank Thanks you, Jeff. Uh, and I, I do want to send uh, Gladys yeah, regards. Uh, unfortunately, she had uh, a death in the family, so she's not going to be able to be, uh, be with us tonight. Uh, but first, we're going to start with the uh, instructional programs. So Anthony is going to talk a, a little bit about uh, what's going on uh, uh, with first of all, uh, and it's we have some very new. We have some new and exciting instructional programs uh, that we're introducing, and then uh, I'll follow him. So. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm going to try to navigate my, uh, all my electronic devices here. <laughs> Is it okay if I move my mouse? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. Uh, well, one second, let me just start. Okay. I would like to extend my thanks to uh, President Buno, Superintendent Simons, and the entire Board of Education for welcoming us this evening to talk a little bit about uh, Press Start 3 and our programs. Um, starting out uh, the, at the request of the Board of Education, we were asked to speak about the PTEC and Early College High School program that we are starting uh, this fall in partnership with all of our component districts and Hudson Valley Community College. So just a little bit about PTEC and Early College High School. Um, the models are part of an RFP that the state put out. Um, we are members of cohort five for both PTEC and Early College High School. And the models permit students to uh, complete their high school graduation requirements along with earning college credits and in the PTEC program, completing an associate's degree. Uh, when the RFP came out, um, we, we applied for initially the Early College High School grant um, and then before we found out about Early College High School, we applied to the PTEC grant. Uh, we were very happy to, uh, to find out that we were awarded both of these grants, uh, which was both challenging and exciting. Uh, but the goal of both programs is to increase the uh, high school graduation and post-secondary degree completion rates of those that are historically underrepresented at the post-secondary level. So some of the details of the programs. The Early College High School program is more of a traditional four-year program, and students earn between 24 and 60 college credits as part of that program. And in the PTEC program, students earn in excess of 60 college credits and an associate's, uh, an AAS degree, an Associates of Applied Sciences. In both cases, both of these programs are offered and college credits um, are at no cost to families. So one of the features of both programs is the workplace visits, the internships, and being first in line for job opportunities. Um, we have four program pathways, which I'll talk about in depth a little bit later. Um, but the first one is computer information systems and cybersecurity. Next, we have um, engineering technology, focusing on civil engineering and architecture, environmental protections, and then finally health sciences. So we are here in uh, Rensselaer County, but uh, the program serves us all seven counties within both the Questar three BOCES and Capital Region BOCES uh, for a total of 46 school districts. So we have both uh, IHE, which is an Institute of Higher Education partner, which is Hudson Valley Community College, and industry partners are very important to this program. Uh, we've identified two already, with the Tech Valley Center of Gravity, which have already been great partners in our, in our development. And then also the uh, Artificial Intelligence Center for Excellence. And then we mentioned Hudson Valley already. <coughs> so both of the programs are gonna be located on the Hudson Valley Community College campus. Uh, they've identified a building right there on the campus, um, which was their former uh, Center for Advanced Manufacturing building, the Lang building. So we'll be the sole occupants of that building, um, and they're doing renovations to both the first and second floor in preparation for our arrival. So students earn as part of the program coursework in uh, college coursework in conjunction with their high school coursework as early as ninth grade. In the case of ninth grade, 
students will be taking a college forum class, which permits them the ability to uh, explore the program pathways and get acclimated to the college environment and the uh, some of the some of the things that they will need to do in order to be successful at the college level. So what is the focus of these programs? And there's a, a lot that went into, um, a great deal of thought that went into the development of the pathways. Um, a lot of conversation amongst the steering committee uh, to identify pathways that would be broad enough to attract um, a variety of students. So we've identified four pathways. Um, there are three pathways within P-TECH and two pathways within early college high school. You'll notice that computer information systems is identified in both the P-TECH and the early college high school pathway, um, creating additional flexibilities for a student who knows they wanna go on to college beyond uh, their early college high school participation and those that maybe wanna enter directly into the workforce after completing their associate's degree. Environment or engineering technology is a P-TECH pathway along with environmental protections, um, focusing on clean energy management is the other, are the other two uh, P-TECH pathways. The second pathway in early college high school is health sciences. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the health sciences pathways, um, fields like um, you know, respiratory therapy, radiologic technology, or dental hygiene, um, all of which have a great forecast of job growth. So when we think about um, identifying the pathways for these programs, forecast of job growth was a, um, was a, a huge factor in that. Um, it really is pointless to have the flexibility and a broad range of, of pathways if there isn't the prospect of, of gainful employment after they complete the program. So when we were identifying the pathways, we wanted to look for pathways that had uh, a large percentage of job growth within the next uh, six, four to six years. So first web development uh, forecasted to grow by 20% by 2028. Civil engineering technology forecasted to grow by 18% by 2026. And environmental, environmental science or environmental service techno, technician forecasted to grow by 17% by 2026. And then health sciences has some of our largest forecasts of job growth within the capital region, anywhere between 22 and 30% forecast of job growth. So definitely, great opportunities for students as they complete the program. So the programs have a lot of similarities and I just wanna go through of, uh, some of them with you. Um, both of the programs, like I said, are, mentioned, are located at the Hudson Valley Community College campus and no cost to families. Um, they're available to students across our entire region. Um, our industry partners are vital in this, and um, while we've identified two already, we know that we have uh, additional partners that we have to identify each of the program pathways. Um, each of the programs are fully aligned with Hudson Valley Community College's AAS degrees. Um, they are, as I mentioned, focused on in-demand uh, jobs and career fields. The dual enrollment coursework um, begins no later, must by the grant, no later than 10th grade in our case, we're beginning uh, in, the, in the ninth grade level with that one course. Students have the ability to articulate to more than 50 colleges uh, through the partnership with Hudson Valley Community College. Workplace visits, internships, uh, students being first in line for job opportunities are key features of both of the programs. And then courses taught by both high school faculty and college faculty. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in, in our forums with uh, parents and students is the location on the college campus. Um, and that is something that is uh, somewhat concerning. I, I know as a parent myself, I'd be uh, a little bit worried about that. Um, but one of the things we've, we really work to ensure is to make sure that we have the separation on the college campus when we want it, but also the access when we need it to the coursework and the faculty and um, guest speakers, things like that. So by being in the Lang Building, we are in, a, in our own environment, and students in the ninth and 10th grade level will stay in that building for all of their coursework. Um, they will not be venturing out to a college, you know, sitting in a college class, not until they're 11th graders. So that, we felt that was very important. It's definitely something that we talked a lot about with the steering committee all throughout the planning process is really trying to ensure that in those early years, 
that we're doing everything in house in that building um, and keeping our, our rising eighth graders in an environment that is uh, that is isolated from the rest of the college population. So key benefits, um, minimum of 24 college credits, and, and in the case of the P-TECH program, in excess of 63 credits for some of the pathways. Uh, it combines the best, best elements of high school, college, and work-based learning all in one experience. It is a rigorous program, um, and we want to make sure that we are providing the proper support for our students in order for them to be successful. They are going to be earning a, a number of college credits very early on in their high school career. We need to make sure they're set up for success. There is a strong emphasis on project-based learning within both of the programs. And in, if you're not familiar with project-based learning, it's really um, experiential learning through doing projects. Um, and not in addition to the coursework, but as part of the coursework. So you're immediately applying the different uh, concepts and skills that you're learning in your subject areas into a project-based environment. We mentioned the work-based uh, work, work site visits and workplace learning experiences. Um, that's another advantage of being on the college campus, the access to the faculty to come into our building in the early years and for our students to experience some of that, those opportunities within the, within the college campus. So who is a successful student? Uh, we really, we really want to make sure that we're ensuring that that it is more of a decision of the student um, in identifying whether or not these characteristics um, mesh with with who they are as a student. We need uh, we need our students to be motivated to explore new and exciting ways to learn. Uh, we need students who are going to be able to, for one, that they're interested in the program pathways and that they're able to succeed in a non-traditional classroom setting. Um, as I mentioned, the project-based learning experience is different, and we want to make sure that students are, are acclimated to that so they can be successful. Um, it is a highly collaborative environment in, in the program. We want to make sure students are, are ready and willing to do that, and they want to have a different type of high school experience. So when I mentioned that, that it is more of a, of a student looking at the, the programs hearing about our, our high school experience and then making sure that, that that is a fit for who they are as a student. That's our goal. Um, we want to make sure that we are not excluding anyone, that we are inclusive of all students if they want to uh, proceed and, and pursue this pathway. So important dates, and we are, we are well on our way and almost completely through our planning year, um, and that will conclude in August of this year. Um, and we are getting ready for our implementation. Uh, students will be arriving starting with the Summer Bridge program in July, and then starting with our first cohort of students in, uh, in September. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Harry at this point. Can we just pause for any uh, questions on the p High School? For any board members, do you have any questions? Very, very straightforward. Uh, Please participate in my, my work, and uh, it's like really exciting, exciting opportunity. You know, Jeff, you've been involved as a sponsoring district and superintendent to help guide that process. And, you know, really, uh, it is such a wonderful opportunity for us to, and at first, I think, to be on a college campus. Like, yeah, so just to mention quickly, the um, our P Tech Early College High School is only the second in New York State to be on a college campus, and the first outside of New York City. Um, we are also, to the best that we can tell, the first of its kind to combine both early college, high school, and P-TECH in one program. So um, we are doing things a, a little bit differently, and we are we are cutting edge. Um, I do want to uh, just say thank you very much to uh, East Greenbridge School District. Uh, you, you've been great partners with us throughout this entire process um, in, the planning, in the planning process. Uh, Superintendent Simons has been a huge part of that. And a, and a great voice in, in those discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Well, no presentation will be complete tonight if we don't talk a little bit about the pandemic. This is, this is the interesting part of the presentation, I guess. Uh, but 
I would say this. I mean, we know I had a huge student impact. We had a huge family impact, uh, instructional impact. Uh, there is so many studies out there about the learning gap that the pandemic has created. I read one from Brown University that said all students are at least uh, a few months to a year behind. And then I read another one from McKenzie Company that said students will never recover from this. Uh, learning gap. So it's, uh, but I, I will assure you the leadership of uh, uh, Superintendent Simon and uh, our whole team were at West Star and all of our superintendents in this region were working very hard to make sure that uh, not one uh, learning gap is going to be very temporary. That's why we are rolling out the kind of programs that uh, Anthony did, uh, described earlier in such uh, detail. Um, so, what we have done, I mean, we have built a lot of partnerships with uh, with, with uh, the counties to try and help us through this uh, pandemic, and the, also with the state health department. Uh, and we do meet on a weekly basis, twice a week, with our superintendents and our business officials, just to coordinate and kind of have a coordinated regional response to when it comes to closures, reopenings, the challenges that we're facing day in and day out. Uh, testing, that was a big issue, you know, I mean, even the, the testing kids for a while was very, very difficult. So, uh, but we stuck together and uh, and we worked together to uh, to go through this, uh, this, uh, this pandemic. I, I would say this, I mean, over at Questa, we have focused for a really, really long time about building an organization that can absorb the punch, can, you know, can handle emergencies. When we were doing our initial planning and, and redesign of our organization, I never thought that I would be dealing with a pandemic. I thought I was going to be dealing with, we thought we were going to be dealing with a terrorist attack, with uh, some kind of uh, weather condition, etc. But here came the pandemic, and I think that's, uh, that's when we tested our system, and that's when our system quite frankly helped us uh, much through this, this, this emergency. Uh, a few years ago, I, had, I remember I did a presentation reminding, reminding up regarding our health and safety uh, services. And uh, you have trusted us with, with your visits, and that was a huge change for, for this district at the time. And, uh, I'm glad to say that you know we're providing a lot of services to, to this district when it comes to health and safety. And quite frankly, uh, I think that uh, we were able to earn your trust, especially with the way uh, we we have to be with this pandemic. Um, now, what I've done is like I, I, I do every year on these on these presentations. I, I kind of summarized uh, the. Oops, was to go back to health and safety, I guess, and talk more about the pandemic. <laughs> uh, but I did summarize the services that you're currently purchasing for us. I guess this is just a sample. We have over 300 different services. You know, these are some of the, the ones that you're buying, obviously, career te technical education and special education. Those are big components. You purchase approximately $5 million worth of services from us. Uh, $2 million is uh, special education services. There is these other bosses services from uh, GASB 75 that calculates uh, the actuarial value of your post employment benefits to Peter. Uh, so there's a huge variety of services that you can purchase from us. So uh, your bosses aid ratio is 61 percent. However, when you look at the bosses aid level services, you get back about 54 cents on the dollar because obviously there's costs in there that they are not uh say so for example anything that becomes property of the district or salaries over thirty thousand dollars for example say that. Uh, the next slide uh, talks about some of other programs that are available i just want to stress the fact that PTEC was listed there because that's a new program uh, and quite frankly your district has been a leader and making sure that uh, that program was established. Uh, uh, Jeff worked with the committee 
that, that kind of created the vision for that program. We went ahead, applied to the state, got the money. Uh, I mean, there was an immense, an immense amount of work that happened in order to make this thing uh, uh, take place. And uh, quite frankly, we have great partners because I know uh, Hudson Valley Community College invested a tremendous amount of funds in infrastructure to make sure that they converted their space to meet the needs of our students. So that's a great new thing for our for our region. Uh, I also would like to talk a little bit or give you an update on the Rensselaer Education Center the revitalization plan. Uh, we've been talking for this about this project for a number of years now. Uh, you recall it was a three three year of three phase program. Uh, two summers ago, we did phase one, which was side work. Uh, we improved the bus loop, the parking lots. We created a new entrance and exit uh, uh, at our facility. Uh, we also uh, improved the drainage uh, of those. Uh, of that side. So that was two summers ago. Last summer, in the midst of the pandemic, we went ahead and uh, completed phase two, which basically what we've done is we, we took care of half of the building and uh, we did a complete kind of rehab job uh, for that half of the building. This summer, we're going to do the other half and then that's it, we're complete with that uh, location. That's a project that has been in the works for more than a decade. I mean, my predecessor who retired 16 years ago, you know, used to, we, we used to have numbers all the time, but oh, how are we going to do the education center? I'm, I'm, I'm just glad that we're bringing that discussion. Uh, to, to uh, I, I got some pictures here of uh, the first space. Uh, that is the, the, the old building. That's the new bus loop. You can see the new parking lot and entrance way that uh, we created, and that happened two summers ago. I also have a little video, if it's going to work, that shows you that what we did uh, last summer. I just hope it's going to, the those embedded links are going to work then. Yeah, not. Not, let me. We try it from here. All right. Well, sometimes it works. That's, that, that actually, that's the first time that I, I, I haven't been able to play it. But anyway, basically, what we've done is uh, we took half of the building, we rearranged some of the uh, some of the classrooms in that building. Uh, we replaced the flooring. We replaced the ceilings. We insulated the 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 ceilings, uh, we reconfigured classrooms, uh, bathrooms, uh, we, for example, our culinary program, we have brand new uh, equipment, brand new uh, freezers, coolers, uh, cosmetology, that was another program that uh, we, we had to rehab in space, so it has all brand new uh, equipment, uh, books, etc. for for, uh, for the students, so it has been uh, it has been a busy summer last year, but uh, it's going to be pretty busy this year also. But uh, we're coming uh, to the end of that particular uh, project. And thank you for your support because you have your support. Uh, uh, then lastly, I also want to thank you for approving our administrative budget. Uh, it was unanimously approved by all of our components. Uh, you are going to see that there's a slight increase uh, on, on, on your share. It's not because there was an increase in the expenditure amount. Uh, you are one of a handful of districts that has seen an increase in their student enrollment. Uh, you know, so, you know, in our region, those 23 school districts, we lost about 260 students. So, when you sum everyone's enrollments together, right? And, uh, you know, there were quite a few districts that lost students. There were quite a few that, uh, again, I think uh, experience have the most gains, so to speak, as far as the number of students. So that's all that I had. I don't know if you have any questions for me.
what I'm saying. Thank you, Harry. Any, any questions for members on the information shared? I Jeff, you can Oh, Jeff, yes. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about um, the grant writing component and what things that you might be offering to, to districts or what you could provide to districts? Yeah, especially with funding, right? Shrinking. Right, right. And we do have a grant writer in house, and we also have uh, contacts with a number of outside grant writers. Uh, and we utilize on a project by project basis. As part of your administrative budget, we do have some basic uh, grant support that we, uh, we provide. So, for example, we do research as far as what programs are out there. We search the federal government websites, the state, etc. So, uh, we kind of share the information. Uh, but then, if a district wants to write specific grants, then we have in-house staff, but we also have uh, other consultants that we utilize on an estimated basis to help my clients. Thanks, Jennifer. Any other questions for Harry? Well, I want to thank Harry and Anthony for uh, everything that they've done during this, well, everything in general, but particularly during since last March, uh, we really Although we don't meet in person very often, we've really gotten to know each other. Uh, within our quest, our he's quite well. As Harry mentioned, we meet twice a week and sometimes three, depending on the situation. Um, I will say that um, a couple of things. Um, I think the decision that we made to switch to the uh, health safety risk management closer uh, could not have been better timed given the needs that we've experienced over the last, uh, you know, 15 months. So I think that's turned, turned out to be a very good uh, shift. And uh, I would agree with Harry's characterization that there are a number of services that we've been receiving from, from that service that's been very, very beneficial. Uh, not only having Sam here uh, two days a week, but also with Craig Hansen really pulling everybody together and continuing to work with all of us on all of the state requirements, facilitating the county department of health meetings, just checking in and making sure that we're doing everything in accordance with what's expected. You know, as rules continue to change, it, it really turned out to be a very accessible service and a quality service. And I just want to say that I appreciate the board uh, supporting that recommendation. PTAC grant, we're very excited about it. The board and I, since the uh, last few years, have talked about uh, making sure that the educational opportunities that we provide for the students provide multiple pathways. If they want to pursue a college degree, if they want to move into a technical uh, field, uh, if they want to um, uh, start to think about what they want to do when they graduate from high school, and there's no better program design to do those things and accomplish all of those things than, than the early college high school and the PTEC model. Uh, we've got nine kids, I think, so far, uh, who've applied to the program. Uh, we don't have the most. I think we're close to having the most. We have the most. We have the most. Yes. Uh, we're hoping that as the students transition into that program, they'll, they'll really benefit from it. Uh, and I'm serving on the steering committee, as was mentioned, make sure that we get that program off the ground successfully. So I'm very encouraged by it and excited about it and looking forward to visiting it in the fall. A um, couple of things that uh, you didn't mention, the summer school initiative uh, that we're putting together will be BOCES aidable uh, for this summer. So we'll use monies from the general fund that we budgeted, but we'll get back at close to 51% or 52% that Harry indicated uh, is our BOCES aid ratio. That will that will be not only beneficial from a from a revenue standpoint next year, but we're also part of the model is our teachers will get to collaborate to develop the curriculum for that program and the assessments for that program with teachers from other districts, which is always very, very powerful uh, experience. So uh, Terry Bordell from Questar met with Jim today and Linda today, they finalized uh, how to make sure that that process of, of uh, claiming the expenses will work. So there's a, there's a number of things that we're doing together and uh, we'll continue to do together to continue to provide great services to the kids in the community. So I appreciate all that you're doing and 
sorry that Dr. Cruz couldn't be here to uh, so that we could thank her, but I, you know, I think uh, I think our relationship and our working relationship in terms of the programs that we're developing are really solid and uh, moving down a very very successful path. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you, Jim. And, and you know, the the one the silver lining in the in the COVID cloud is that we did got closer together as a region, yeah. and uh, we are working more closely together than we ever were. And I think, quite frankly, that's the byproduct of COVID. Uh, so that's, uh, if there's any good news about the pandemic, maybe that's it. But uh, we'll continue doing that, and uh, with more good things are going to be coming out of uh, East Greenwich School District and West Street. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Harry, I don't have a question, just a comment. Um, where we where we were and where we're going is, is great to see. Um, the collaboration and some of the tensions that were here years ago, have, we've really moved uh, past that. I know within our own group, it was a lot of discussion in your group, and I just want to for you to go back and express to your folks and to Gladys that we appreciate that because it truly demonstrates that we're all here and we're putting the students first. And I think that's what, if we can say anything about the relationship that East Greenbush has with Questar, it is student driven and, and we've put that back on track. Being That being said, you've, you set the bar so high that we're really expecting even greater things next year. So <laughs> thanks again, at least relay that to everyone else. Thank you, thank you. Harry, don't feel bad, he says that to me every year. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> so we're gonna screw up once in a while just <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank you, folks. Mark, has a comment? Yeah, just um, being on Quest Art Board as well. Um, you know, I can attest to what Anthony and Harry have said. And, uh, you know, I went to that Marine Civil Rights Center before any of the projects started, and we got a couple tours of it, and it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's just state of the art. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. But I also get to see sitting on Quest Art Board our kids from East Greenbush and the successes that that they're definitely having up in up in Questar and uh, you know, it, it, it's it's just a testament to you know, these two gentlemen and Gladys and all the programs that and that Questar offers and you know I'm so glad that we're, we're really involved uh, where we are with Questar and uh, to put a little plug out there for Gladys. Gladys was chosen uh, by the Albany Business Review as one of their 2021 uh, leaders in diversity the other day. So, so that's a huge testament to her and everything she does uh, over at uh, Quest Art. So appreciate that, Anthony, Harry, appreciate everything you guys do with Gladys. And pass on our, our sympathy to her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And then, uh, Really, I just echo what John said, the, the, the range of opportunities that are available to students in this region, in our district in particular, because we aim to serve all our families and all our communities in this district and give our students those opportunities to explore and to find their path and to be successful adults and go on to successful careers, college or great to high school to career or the military. And we want to provide to provide those opportunities for our children and our families and i think that the things that quest our OCs can do to help support those opportunities for kids and families in the region is important and i know our, our children and our families have taken advantage of those opportunities uh, to a great degree and then the p tech and like college high school is another example of of expanding those opportunities for kids and it's just great to see and uh, be part of so thank you and i want to thank mark for his service on the board Question. Three years. <laughs> Three elected. Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you, folks. Have a great night. Thank you. We do have a second presentation tonight, and it'll be by Mr. McHugh. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. McHugh is going to present uh, the completion of the Grade Two and Grade Three standards based report cards project. Mr. McHugh. <laughs> Good evening. Just want to give an update on our standard space report cards. Uh, if you 
remember we talked about this about two years ago, kindergarten and grade one, implementing standards-based report cards. Uh, part of board feedback is to make sure that we put something in place to review after the initial implementation. So I'll, I'll talk about that briefly. But a real quick timeline. Fall 2018, we established the Cable and Report Card Committee. It, it was formed. It had 10 teachers, five kindergarten teachers, one from each of our elementary buildings, five first grade teachers, one from each of our elementary buildings. In the fall of 2019, we piloted the new standards-based report card in K and grade one. And also in the fall of 19, we established a grade two and a grade three report card to be again, making sure that we had one teacher rep from each of our five elementary buildings at both grade levels. Fall 2020, we uh, the new standards-based report cards in kindergarten grade one were fully, fully implemented. I just point out that it is in power school, which means that uh, Right now, with the adoption of the grades two and grade three standard-based report cards, K through 12 district-wide, our report cards are on our student information system generated through PowerSchool. Uh, spring 2021, we uh, solicited feedback from our kindergarten and grade one teachers, so we brought them together. And uh, I believe that, that was also a concern from our board when we first implemented that we wanted to make sure that we, we monitored it sought out feedback and then we made the necessary changes. So uh, based on the feedback that we received, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, it wasn't the report card in design, what it was was the rubric of the pacing. So these standards-based report cards, and I'll talk about that, uh, they also put the focus back on teaching and learning, but they also make sure that we are consistent in all five of our elementary buildings in regards to what we teach and when we teach it. Uh, the new standards-based report cards for grades two and three were completed this spring. They were presented to CCS on May 5th. Uh, and really, uh, just a quick walkthrough on this is what really generated this is some deep discussions about the purpose of a grade and what follows after the grade. So what's the purpose of the grade, what follows after the grade, and who's the report card actually for? The report card is a communication tool to parents to let parents know exactly how their child is progressing towards those standards. Um, what should we be grading and what shouldn't we be grading? Uh, how consistent should grades be and grading be across time and across teachers? Meaning that, you know, if you look back at our old report cards, and uh, if this is the sake of a letter grade, A, B, C, D, is, is an A in, in one teacher's classroom going to be an A in another teacher's classroom? That's really important to really have that consistency. Um, do we have quality controls in place when it comes to grading? Uh, do we have any district-wide criteria that helps us with grading? And what criteria could be, should be used? In other words, is an A in mathematics in one class going to be an A uh, in another teacher's class at the same grade level? What do we currently base our grades on? Instructional resources, opinions, assessments, standards? How do we really come about what constitutes that final grade? So this generated a lot of deep uh, professional dialogue. Uh, do we currently grade and, re and report on what we actually teach? Is teaching, assessing, and reporting currently aligned? And how difficult is it to currently defend your grades? Is there anything that would make it easier? Uh, so when we think about the value of those parent-teacher conferences, and really the emphasis should be on how the child's progressing towards those standards, uh, are we in a difficult situation at that time? justifying a grade when they asked what constituted that grade. So we were looking for more consistency. You know, we talked about what we really wanted. And then just to generate some discussion, you know, letter grades, I made just some general statements and then opened it up just to get the conversation going. But letter grades don't break things down enough. I don't know what my child specifically needs to do in order to improve. For example, from a B to an A. So when you get that report card and you look at that grade, does it really let you know what your child really needs to work on in order to show that growth? Failure to give grades against the state standards is irresponsible. So we have the state standards that are uh, what we should be aligned to and our teaching should be aligned to. Should an effort and progress be more heavily weighted at first than simple academic achievement? You should utilize rubrics and give grades against all rubrics at the end of each marking period. Rubrics to, rubrics to track progress over time against the standards. 
I don't think a week in the time that I've been in this position working for Mr. Simon that he hasn't said the word rubric. So I'm pretty sure he uses rubrics at home. He's a rubric guy. Uh, but that's the power. I tried it and didn't fly the law. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's actually the power. It is the rubrics that are really driving our report cards. Uh, you know, and then the comment that I didn't teach that yet. Assessments should be based in terms of longer term learning goals versus grades that are just the average of recent quizzes, tests, and projects. Uh, you know, in that part that I didn't teach that yet, when you're putting four or five teachers in the room together in, a, in the same building, and they didn't teach the same content and the same standards, that's problematic, okay? Um, you know, especially when we look at the number of students that uh, relocate during the school year from one of our elementary buildings to another elementary building. You know, we had a situation where students might change schools right in the district and they already read that book or they already covered that math concept. So this has really tightened that up quite a bit along with our mapping. Uh, you know, a report card most importantly should be honest and fair, an honest account of the student's strengths and weaknesses against the standards, uh, mindful of extenuating circumstances. To be credible, a grade, a judgment must be based on multiple and varied assessments. We're working towards this in our mapping, so we're working on developing consistent end of the unit assessments, K through five. So all students are taking the same assessment. We're working on that even throughout the other grade levels, the high school, common midterms, things. Those have been things that we've worked on. Uh, iterator reliability, measurable data. Human judgments must be as objective as possible, reliable. You know, objective is reliable, subjective bias can be good or bad. We just talked about these things. We talked about our older report cards. They, first of all, they weren't aligned to the standards. The process of actually completing the report card, very laborious. Grade three had a separate uh, carbon copy form for special areas. So a special area teacher, if, if they're were 100 students in grade three, they were filling out 100 carbon copy forms for, for art. That's all gone away. Um, don't allow our parents or our students to easily grasp the feedback we want to provide. And I talked about that. If you look at the old report cards, there were a lot of keys. There was S, satisfactory, O, outstanding, check, check plus. Uh, you know, you really, you really have spent a lot of time memorizing that key and going back and looking at the report card. Uh, a few non-negotiables before we started our work. We wanted uniformity in the sense of we were either going to go with our, stay with our traditional grading or we were going to move to standards-based grading. Consistency and approach, all five buildings. The critical steps, really important, was communication. Uh, making sure that our principals were aware of the work that was being done, what our end goal was, uh, what we were working for, what the update, progress, Faculty and staff making sure that we had representation from all five buildings and making sure that those representatives were going back to their buildings to communicate with their grade level peers and colleagues, getting that feedback. Parents, we use the report card guide. So there's a specific report card guide that's been created for each of those grades. That tool is out on desktops for open house and Teachers are walking parents through. That was a big transition going from traditional grading to standards-based grading. Right? We all remember how we were graded. We had the letter grades, we had numerical grades, so standard-based grading, new. I think the pilot helped quite a bit. And remember, our kindergarten and first grade parents and students are accustomed to this now. So the transition to grades two and three, it was done in, in a good sequence, K1, now two, three. Uh, training and support. Our own uh, data department, Todd Witherall, did a phenomenal job uh, training our teachers on how to use it through PowerSchool. So the actual rubrics are an add-on feature, a customization in, in PowerSchool. Teachers are completing that rubric during the, the term. There's three terms in the elementary. When the marking period ends, those report cards are automatically generated. When it's, when it's parent-teacher conference time, those teachers are sitting with parents with that report card out, but with the rubric out. It, it, it's specifically for every entry in the report card, there's a rubric entry describing what a level four is, describing what a level three is, describing what a level two and a level one is. So 
there's transparency. Parents know exactly what the child needs to be able to demonstrate, what they need to be able to do in order to be at that level three or level four. Uh, we continue to monitor the rollout and we revisit and we're responsive. We seek and respond to stakeholder feedback. Um, if I can get a report card up, can you pull one up for me, Peter? It's my grade one. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Uh, can you pull another, this is uh, either grade two or grade three? Yeah. So here's a grade two report card, term one, term two, term three. Uh, you can see right here, reads and identifies sight words. There's areas where it is, can you roll it up just a little bit? You can see here, here's a better example. Demonstrates an, an understanding of informational text. It's great in, because that's not a standard or a concept that's being taught in term one. What that does when it's grayed out in that box is nobody can stray. <laughs> Every teacher needs to make sure that that's not what they're being, uh, you know, that's not what they're teaching during that term one. That, that, that concept starts to be evaluated in term two. So it does control the pacing. It does control the content that's being taught each term. And we have greater consistency in all of our elementary buildings. Teachers are on the same page. It's aligned to the maps that we've created. So all of that mapping that we worked on for years now, and that mapping will continue, it's a, the report cards are aligned to that. Uh, so every entry that you see on this report card, there's a rubric, an accompanying rubric, that actually describes what a level four, level three, level two, level one is. Any questions? Comments? Yeah. So just out of curiosity, because um, I can appreciate the complexity of, of this, um, differentiated learning. So how does that integrate into, so for example, if I'm bringing out right, the more advanced right, in that term one, how does the differentiated learning, learning kind of lay over that gym? Do you know what you've got? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Peter. Meaning that we modify the expectation. That's the great thing. That's a great question. And, and, and that's the bonus of standards-based grading. So it's taking the emphasis off of that grade. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the typical little league field and soccer field, mm -hmm. you know, report cards came out. My child got a 92 in science, or my child got a B in mathematics. What did your child? It puts the focus and the emphasis back on teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So if there is the, the, the New York State standards, the next generation standards are the standards. They're the standards for all students. Mm -hmm. So it's how the student is progressing to meet that standard. So the differentiation is right in the levels. You know, a student may be a, may be a level two on that particular standard at that time. But it's a clear path and a clear explanation of what the student needs to accomplish. So if there is a student with an individual education plan, then that individual education plan puts those supports in place so the students can be at that level three and level four. Um, does that help it answer does. that question? It does. It's just when you look at it, right? And yeah, think of it's an adjustment time. period. Absolutely. What, what I will say also is that uh, there's been several school districts that have found these report cards <laughs> and have called and contacted us to ask us, can I purchase them? Can I borrow them? So they're online, they're in PDF format, have at it. We've been very uh, good neighbors and we've, we've uh, shared these out, but there's been people that have contacted us from all over the state. Uh, looking at these. So the goal is that the grade two and grade three report cards, standard-based report cards are implemented next year. We'll start to put a grade four and a grade five report card committee together and we'll start to revisit that. There will be a transition period where we go back towards traditional grading. Where that goes, that's the, I'll, I'll report back to you. <laughs> That'll come out of that committee work. Any questions? Maybe you found a new funding stream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your work on this. Um, I think the consistency will prove monumental when these kids get to golf and they've been taught the same thing or integrated the same way. Um, I really think that we will see the benefits of this when the kids get to golf. I, I agree. And the other thing that will also be noticeable at golf is you saw there was a Great science and social studies are on the report cards. It's being graded. It needs to be taught. 
so there's been such a heavy focus on ELA and mathematics in the elementary school, and that's really that's come that came down from the state, right? They have that accountability tied to APPR, science and social studies took a back burner. It's on the report cards. We have those consistent units of instruction in science and social studies. I think what we will hear from our uh, middle school teachers and eventually our high school teachers is that the kids are coming with a better foundational knowledge, especially in the in the content areas. So, Thank you. Jim, one question. <clears throat> on level three report card, Team one is, is blank or get grayed out for art, music, and gym. Why, why would that be? We, have, we haven't put an official grade. That's that's the way they do it consistently. So it, did you send the grade two report card? Uh, I, yeah, I didn't know Term that. one, there's no grade. Oh, it's okay. a slight transition to grading. So gotcha. if you look at the K and grade one report card, it's 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 not listed on there. And then that's where it start, starts to be introduced. So grade two, the first term, they're not getting that grade. And then they are getting the grade. Thank you. And just a comment. There's a tremendous amount of work that went into this and a lot of conversation and very evident. And I would encourage anybody that has access to this presentation and the public to look at it. Because I think it identifies, you know, we keep talking about student-based learning and student progress, but we're getting back to the individual and being able to tailor their educational plan when you have a good litmus to see how they're doing and the progress they're truly making. And that is one of the things that we've been talking about for years. When I think about my own school experiences and my children's school experience, the subjectivity at the lower grade levels can be really detrimental and allow a kid to slip through without really identifying some of the the needs, and I think that this gives us a great opportunity for earlier interventions um, before they get into that real critical thing. Not that you need any more work, but one of the challenges with the grading is at the middle school and high school level as well, because again, I do like the idea of teachers' individual strengths and their different teaching styles because it teaches some resiliency and in, in, in part of that path. But one of the things I would like to see as this model goes into the, you know, makes it to that level is that consistency and grading might not have to be as intense as this, but to have a general departmental standard to where there is no rubric because then it will um, truly get rid of the people who are shopping teachers, so to speak, that quite honestly has gone on even when I was in million years ago when the horse was Ken uh, in school, we navigated through that, those types of paths. Whereas if we create a, a, a really good rubric as we move through, the benefit will, like you said, go up to that middle school and high school level because that's when it gets really challenging. So again, thanks for the, the effort. I think it's, I think it goes to, sh to the emphasis on long-term planning that we put in educational plans is going to outlive at least our tenure on the board and in the district for, for a long time to come. So I really appreciate your efforts in this. Yeah, just a quick comment because I, I don't want the middle school to be neglected either. They, they have really engaged in a lot of curriculum writing over the summers, but those, those things you don't see that work uh, for a period of time. So uh, they engaged in curriculum mapping and mathematics and science. And what we have tried to do is we try to get all the teachers or give all the teachers the ability to engage in that work, right? Rather than one or two doing that work in the summer and doing that curriculum mapping and that curriculum writing because we want people to own it and we want people to utilize it. So we, we have broadened that quite a bit. When we do some curriculum work, we, we could have 10 or 12 people working in the summer on that curriculum project. I think that's really important, the way you just frame that, and, and not to, we want to keep our teachers engaged, and I do believe in brainstorming and, and group think, especially on the department level, and I never want a teacher to lose their own personal style because of the standard, but as long as we, we get to the goal where the, the kids are learning 
you know, you can learn differently, but still know the same thing at the end of the day. And I think that's what makes high school special, is that you can get to a, a teacher that is really excited about what they do, and, it, and that student clicks with that teacher because a lot of it is personality and, and style for people. And I think when kids have that opportunity to gravitate where they feel comfortable, they will then learn more. And the same goes for teachers. If they teach in a lane that they're comfortable in, they'll be a lot more effective. And I, I, I just think that the environment that you guys have provided for our staff really just encourages that. And I just want to see that grow and continue. So thanks again. Thanks, John. You have any other comments? Yep. Tremendous work. I want to thank the staff that are involved and uh, the districts who like like that work that is being done. The important part, like you said, John, is really the conversations, the questions you posed earlier to get to that point so teachers and staff understand, families understand. That's a lot of work. Um, it's not a boilerplate kind of thing. It's got to have those conversations that take place beforehand so our parents, the community can understand what's happening how they can help their child and make those uh, those meaningful transitions to this uh, this grading system. So kudos to the team and, and to the leader. All right, very good. That, can, that's it. that concludes our reports and presentations. We have several discussion items. Um, the first discussion item is the annual reward meeting in July in the scheduled draft. Um, Jeff, you want to Comment about your rework? Yeah. I, um, as we were putting together the board calendar for next year, um, I came to realize quickly that the, um, the, the organizational meeting or the reorg meeting is required by uh, state education department law to be on uh, the first Tuesday in July. Um, but if it's a legal holiday, it can move to the Wednesday. Uh, but also boards can adjust that date as long as you have it by the 15th of the month. So I had a conversation with Don Budman, and he's prepared to send a resolution if the board is available uh, that week. I, I didn't realize that I had a prior vacation that I better take if the, if the quorum of the board can be here. So. Um, so I'm asking the board to consider moving it to the week of the 15th. Uh, and if the board is comfortable with that, and you have availability, I'll ask Don to draft a resolution and we'll have it on the agenda for the next meeting. So what day are you looking at, John? So this, this uh, the, the handout said July 13th, is that right? Yeah. Yes, but it could be the 13th, the 14th, or the 15th, as long as it's done by the 15th. I'm on vacation that week. I'm here. Just show of hands. Cheryl, you'll be new to the board too. We'll be here. John, myself. Yeah. I think we'll have a quorum. And we'll check with uh, Kathleen at the end. All right. Which day is preferable to those that could be here that are here this week? Does it matter? 13 to 14 for me is better. 13. Okay. So 13th is okay right now? Yeah. Cheryl, is it okay with you? Okay. So we'll, we'll, have to, we'll check in with Kathleen and uh, Anna and then we'll see the resolution. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. And we did try to schedule a couple more meetings. There's a lot of things happening with uh, school opening in the fall that we want to make sure that we cover any um, school business. So there is an additional week. I know that may get stress for vacations, things like that. But if we can kind of get through that um, to help administration and the team to uh, address some of the business things that they have to do. As we, we go back to school in the fall, I want to say reopen because we're open. It's, right. it's a different thing. But, um, so you do those kinds of things. So if there's going to be um, some challenges, look at that schedule. Let myself or Jeff know so we can at least make sure that there's quorum. We had it in an August meeting. We usually have one yeah. in the summer. But with everything regarding opening in September, as Mike said, we think we might need another meeting. And then there were other some, some months where we've only had one meeting where there's a three week lag between meetings and it creates a, a volume of administrative responsibilities you have to bring to the board and sometimes it lengthens the meetings. So November and December, we did adjust compared to prior years, the week that we're having the meeting 
and we've gone to two meetings, if that's okay with the board. Okay. Work for me. And our feedback just looks up now, okay? Thank you. Thank you for helping me stay married by going <laughs> on vacation. <laughs> that was a joke. The next uh, item B is the policy admission of non-resident students. Go back a little Yes, uh, last year we received a request from an employee um, that we could not grant because our current policy regarding um, non-resident students required the payment of tuition. At the time, uh, Mark Mann, our board vice president, asked for us to consider a policy that would permit employees to attend, uh, have their children attend the school district uh, and to waive the tuition. Uh, for employees that were non residents. Uh, we had two policy committee meetings uh, with our policy committee to discuss uh, this topic. We made some revisions to the current uh, admission of non resident students policy. We reviewed those changes with our uh, attorney, Don Budman. So basically, what we have done is revised the current policy 5152 that covers non resident students to permit employees to allow their children to attend uh, tuition free. Uh, there are some caveats and parameters for that approval. It includes submitting an application to the district by February so that we know how many students we can project uh, as we prepare our budget. It also provides a reinforcement that transportation would not be provided for non-resident students. Uh, which is our current policy, even in the case of employees, they would have to have transportation to school provided by the parent or some other arrangement. The policy also uh, indicates that uh, consideration of admission of non-resident students would not contribute to uh, larger, class, uh, larger class sizes than what we're used to, uh, incur additional expenses that uh, could be foreseen, for example, having to add additional classroom sections of elementary grades. The policy would also not guarantee that an employee would be able to have their child, for example, at the elementary school level, attend the school that they actually work in. It would be based on enrollment and class sizes across, for example, the five elementary schools. And the um, other uh, provision we put in is that uh, this policy would not uh, waive any contractual requirements of our employees. So uh, their work hours, for example, uh, the time that they have to report to school, the time that they are required to stay to the end, that uh, we would not, this policy would not accommodate any changes in uh, the work day as required by the contract. And that was based on uh, board feedback at the policy committee. So we feel we've addressed almost every issue. This is a policy that we would want to monitor uh, if we decide to go in this direction. Uh, the policy also, I forgot to mention, requires that the student maintain good academic achievement and follow the code of conduct. So if we had a situation, for example, where uh, Factors such as a disciplinary concern contributed to a decision for, uh, perhaps to happen in another district. If there was a disciplinary concern in another district and triggered the request, um, or a situation that occurred when the student was here, uh, this is a benefit that we're providing to our employees and it can be revoked. Any uh, feedback for? On the uh, policy, I think you covered. I mean, I, I really appreciate the the questions I have were answered. Um, I would like to see the data. I, I think we have to have something in place to see how this works for a couple of years. Yeah. I would like to revisit it in case there is some some concerns about numbers and placements and things like that. Uh, and you ultimately have the the final decision making. Right? Yes. But I think you, you know the elementary question for me is important. Where they go. It's not a guarantee at a particular school. It's based on a moment. Um, it could, could potentially be shifted to another school. 
you want to read the district. So those kinds of things are important for, for families who choose to send their children. So next steps, is there any other comments? No? Next steps? Well, we, we scheduled this as a discussion item tonight, so it's not on for a first reading. Uh, if there are no concerns or objections to this, we would bring it forward to the next meeting as the first reading, okay. as we typically do. And if anybody has any questions or comments between now and next time, or between the first reading and the second reading, we can make revisions to the policy. Yeah. I think that because it's on a discussion item, if there are many members who want to do weigh in on it, mm -hmm. so we can that too. So we can support them. I agree with that. That sounds good. Very good. Let's just take a quick question. Yeah. Is, you, is there a Will this create a flood, or is it, have you have a litmus for how much the employees would utilize this? I don't really. I don't really know. I haven't discussed this with employee groups yet because I wasn't sure whether or not the board was going to approve the policy. I would I would say that I think that some of our employees would uh, want to benefit from this change. I don't know how many. I know there are other factors that would enter into a parent's mind. You know, kids going to the same school with, their, with the kids in their neighborhood, uh, you know, generally is something that would prevent somebody from uh, doing this. I think it's going to be very individualized based on the family circumstances. Okay, thank you. I think revisiting the, the issue and get more data about that. We can provide class, we can we can provide you with class size data, uh, resident students versus non-resident students by building. Resident students are attending uh, by building and by grade level. Yeah, they have to do that. I don't think we really ever had a problem with tuition paying members or non resident students flooding the district or saying no, that's what we need. I agree that I don't think we're going to have a huge, a huge influx, but uh, I think it's a policy solid. Uh, I think it's a good policy. Uh, receive funding. Right. Uh, students. So I, I wasn't that wasn't my concern at all. I, I, I welcome I think if we could encourage people to pay us tuition uh, join us in the, this great service we're provided. It's great. I was just looking at it as an employee benefit. That because then we're not getting any tuition, right? So that that and I didn't. I was just concerned. I mean, I'm, I I don't want to say concerned, but I just was wondering if you had an idea that because say hypothetically, if ten people did it right away, that is an, an economic impact to us. And I just want to be prepared for that impact. There. So I'm not opposed to the impact, but I I just if we have some data, it would be good to kind of have an idea of what we're in for. I think that February 1st, some of the sample policies that we looked at have June deadlines. I talked to the policy committee that I would prefer February so that we could manage where those kids would be assigned uh, as we do our class size projections and number of sections across K-5, which is part of our budget process. The other thing is to let the parent know early enough that, well, yes, we can accommodate your child, but it, it may be a different school than what they anticipated. And the reasons are because we want to have the class sizes be equitable across the district as much as possible. But we will definitely keep the board informed once this policy is approved of you know what's happening with it, how many students are, are we anticipating coming into the district and whether or not it is having an impact. One thing I forgot to add was um, this isn't substitutes are not eligible for this. If we talked about that with the committee. These are these are Employees that are, they can be probationary employees, but they are, they are, uh, you know, um, regular employees, not, not substitutes. Very good. Next item, uh, see end of year celebration ceremonies and activities. Yes, I have received some communications from parents regarding some of the end of the year celebrations. And I wanted to take an opportunity publicly to talk about the efforts that are going on to make sure that we celebrate the achievement of our kids uh, at the end of this year appropriately. And I think we are doing that, fifth grade level and at the eighth grade level and at the 
high school level. I'll start with graduation. Around April 27th, the state issued uh, new guidance for end of the year celebration, which included parameters for indoor and outdoor ceremonies. Uh, it included virtual ceremonies uh, all the way up to uh, outdoor ceremonies. Since then, uh, we look at uh, that policy and any changes that have come forth, which haven't been very many. And the initial guidance indicated that for an outdoor ceremony, if you had more than 250 attendees, you had to require the attendees to provide a proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. In the case of a rapid test, that test had to be conducted within six hours prior to the ceremony. In the case of the PCR test, it had to be 72 hours prior to the ceremony. It was 250. Uh, you go to 251, they've got to have those two requirements. And we discussed uh, here, actually, at a board meeting that we felt that we would run into some difficulties managing that process and enforcing that process. And well, so we decided that we would stay within the limits of 250 attendees. We received some clarification from the state for both athletics and graduations that the students don't count as part of that 250 as long as they are sitting in a different area than the spectators or the attendees. But even with our size class, we are still looking at uh, very, very large numbers uh, with 350, a little bit shy of 350 students 700 attendees if it was two parents uh, or uh, two family members attending. So the 700 was well over the threshold and so we decided to go with multiple ceremonies to reduce the number of uh, attendees within those limits which reduces the number of students that graduate through you know, each of the respective ceremonies. Since that time the state indicated one change and they raised the number of attendees for an outdoor ceremony to five to 500. And so uh, in that case, we took a look at what could be done. We even considered the alternative of having one ceremony. And we felt that given the capacity of the high school, in combination with the challenges of ensuring that everyone there, every person there who is attending that ceremony would have the proof of a uh, negative COVID test and vaccine, that we could potentially run into a situation where someone was denied access to the ceremony and could cause potential uh, disruption, and we didn't want to take that chance. And so we decided now that we could let more people in, and I conferred with some of our board officers as well as with the high school administrators, our central office team, Mr. Harkin's team here at the high school, and Karen Vincent, our COVID coordinator, and Molly McGrath. And we examined the logistics that would be involved in requiring the testing, and we just came to the conclusion that it would be potentially fraught with problems. So we did decide to address some of the concerns that we've had about perhaps providing students with opportunity to bring more than just two guests. And we made an adjustment from our original four ceremony model uh, down to three. And we are allowing families to bring, or students to bring four guests. And we feel that that is an adjustment that will keep us within the parameters of the state and guidance. We think it will provide more opportunities for our graduates to invite brothers and sisters, for example, or grandma and grandpa. And we think at this point, unless uh, something unforeseeable happens, that's the model we're going to go with for the high school graduation. At the middle school level, the PTO uh, worked with Joe Barker, the principal, to survey the parents. The initial survey that went out 
We included a similar program that occurred last year for eighth grade elevation, which was really a drive-through uh, celebration in front of the school. Uh, second option included uh, virtual award ceremonies and some other things. We added a third option once we had confidence that the graduation ceremony could be set up in advance on a Thursday, we're going to use the same structure for eighth grade elevation, same setup at the high school on the high school field, same seating arrangements, same procedures, same equipment, including the use of the um, jumbotron uh, and uh, live streaming. So they will have eighth graders will have a ceremony uh, at the high school on Thursday evening. I think that's the 24th. Okay. And the rain date for that will be the next morning because the afternoon is scheduled for the high school ceremony. So we think in the case of both the middle school elevation celebration and the high school graduation ceremony that it will be very nice for our graduates. And while we wish we could have all the kids together and invite as many guests as uh, we wanted, we think that what we will be offering in the community that they will be very, very nice and, and appropriate. And then students are free to, if students are not assigned to a group and all of their friends, certainly after the ceremonies are completed, um, we recognize that there will be other things, social, social experiences, graduation parties, other things happening. It's one of the reasons why we moved it to a Friday, because families had been expressing to us that they wanted to have the Saturday open uh, for uh, graduation uh, celebrations. At the fifth grade level, there's lots of things happening for the kids. Uh, logistics of setting up uh, a ceremony uh, for fifth grade moving up are a little bit more difficult. Younger children, more people, not necessarily appropriate outdoor facilities in every building. So the fifth grade principals all got together and developed the same plan. And that will be a drive-through event, but a little bit more extended than last year. Kids will be able to get out of the cars with their families, receive gifts and certificates as they have in the past. There'll be an opportunity for photos uh, to be taken outside of the car. There'll be music playing, decorations, and all kinds of fanfare out in front of the schools, and we think it will be very, very nice. In addition, the fifth grade principals are all having field days that they have traditionally had, school-wide picnics that they traditionally had. Uh, and some are taking students to the fun park in East Greenbush. All of these activities are being done within the current guidance. I've reviewed every one of them. I've signed off on every one of them. And I think it will be very nice for our fifth graders, our eighth graders, and our senior graduates this year. And hopefully next year, uh, we may find that we like having, honestly, we might find we like having a ceremony in the high school. Uh, and uh, we may explore ways to maintain that or we'll go back to utilizing a venue that can accommodate all of our children and, uh, and their families. A lot of effort has been put into it by our principals and our administrative team. Sure. Any comments on the end of the year graduation, for graduation, elevation? Yeah, right. kind of for the high school side, I know that um, all the work that was done to change and to modify and with the guidance um, allow us to uh, families to be more present. I know that was something we talked about having someone who uh, my son graduated recently from New Albany, and it was kind of a walkthrough ceremony, but it allowed more of us to be there, which I think was important, which is a distinction from last year. We this will allow much more uh, family members, guests, friends to, to be part of that. And it's, it's really a special event. I know I feel bad that we can't be all together, but uh, we'll make it special for everybody. Thank you. Jennifer? Yeah, I know that the uh, the question. I know that the question has come up a lot on um, the correspondence that we've all been receiving. Can you talk a little bit about why perhaps the decision was to not go to another venue um, 
our options. So I think that that's uh, something that's been weighing heavily on the minds of the parents because they're seeing the other districts around us yep. looking at those venues and securing those venues. I know that Mr. Hart did, spoke to uh, all of the venues that you're referring to, the Times Union Arena, uh, Times Union Center, the uh, Hudson Valley couldn't guarantee at the time that they would be not involved in testing. Uh, there were fluctuating prices quoted to different districts related to the Times Union. I think it's about sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars. That wasn't the primary factor uh, uh, that we determined to rule that out. Um, it was really about making sure that we, as a district, uh, we know our kids. We know our families. Uh, we think there is some benefit to having it on our own property uh, because of all of the restrictions. Uh, we have re existing relationships, and honestly, we worried about someone unknown to a family, security person. I'm sure I'm certain will do a very good job getting into a situation with one of our families and saying, "Well, you can't come. Grandpa can't come in. Grandma can't come in. Uh, you don't have your proof of vaccination." One of the benefits that other districts have spoke of regarding going to the time Union arena is that they don't have to deal with that. I feel like as a district, as we have relationships with people, uh, that we have, uh, we know the kids, that we should be the ones um, facilitating the ceremony and not remove ourselves from that responsibility. So that's ultimately why we decided to do it the way that we're doing it. I have had situations, not here, but in the past where an outside venue was utilized, and the folks that were enforcing the rules didn't understand the importance of our relationships with the kids and our relationships with the families, and it soured the event. So we, we weighed it, we tried it, we thought about it, but at the end of the day, we thought we had more control and a better chance of success if we did it ourselves. Thank you, I think that's great. Yeah. So that everybody can kind of understand what the thought I, process was. I, I appreciate that question, Jennifer. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> we have a few more discussion items. The next one's on the uh, federal funding for the American Rescue Plan, um, CRRSA. There was some suggestions um, put out. There's a template that has to be filled out on those funds, and then some ideas around that. Do you want to talk briefly about that, Jeff? Uh, yes, I, I think by the next meeting we'll have a more detailed document that's filled in to share with you. We're still in the process, of our central office team uh, and others, of uh, identifying the needs that we're going to have and uh, developing some proposals to the board's review. As you recall, we're getting about $7 million in funds uh, that are outside the general fund budget. We want to be prudent about how those monies are spent. CARES Act monies, as well as the uh, American Rescue Act monies. Uh, this is a template that was provided by Quest Arbosis through the New York State School Boards Association to plan out the expenditures. We envision putting together something that looks much like our scorecard as a plan that has the evaluation tool, uh, measures, dates, timelines, objectives. Right now we're brainstorming. We're talking about such things as uh, academic learning gaps, what can we do to provide early intervention in our early elementary grades, K through three? Uh, that may involve deploying some additional staff that would eventually attrition out as people retire so that if kids are coming into kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, and their reading levels and math levels, we can give them a boost by providing smaller teacher-student ratios. We're also talking about the mental health needs uh, of our students. We are in conversations with Kathy Coons, Rensselaer County uh, Commissioner of Mental Health, about a school based clinic uh, that would be supplemental to what our counselors and social workers already do. Uh, the benefits of a school based clinic are if a student has an appointment for an outside referral, they're more likely to attend that appointment if the clinic is right there in the school. The family can get, that, get access to it. And that may not actually cost a lot of money, if any money, because it's Medicaid reimbursable through the county. So we're talking about that. We're talking about ways that we can use this money to address air quality. And through our construction meetings, we've been talking with uh, uh, 
uh, Lynn from St. Al Rubin, as well as our architect and train about what we might be able to do to start the process of upgrading unit ventilators uh, that, will, that will handle some of the higher uh, higher grade filters and a number of other areas. Talking about student engagement at the middle school and the high school level, if we can provide ways for kids to who may be chronically absent uh, to come back to school and want to be in school because they're involved in a program that might be a culinary program, for example, or a vocational program earlier than when they're eligible to start at OCs. Linda and Jim helped me out. Marissa, what, what am I missing? We'll have a whole list for you in the next meeting, but yeah. we are working on this. Yeah. Actually, you, you, you covered quite a few. Uh, we did talk about possibly extending the CTEP program into grade five. Yes. Uh, and we considered the math, we're considering the math program, extending that to grade six. Uh, in addition to, we did talk about possibly starting our own autism program in the district. And we talked about some technology needs and how we might use some of this money to, uh, you know, uh, satisfy our technology needs and, and continue us into the future. Uh, we talked about um, some help desk, um, possibly uh, it would be run by students possibly um, with oversight by our own district employees. And I think that's that one. So very much an early early work in progress. Um, and uh, we will have a complete draft to share with you. Uh, I'll share it in advance of the next board meeting so if board members want to uh, ask questions or make comments. Um, as we speak, we're still getting documents from NISPA and uh, in this case, and other organizations about how to interpret these federal guidelines. The position such as the COVID coordinator can be funded in it. So uh, if we need to maintain the COVID coordinator for next year, which I think we will have to, uh, that'll be um, put into that grant. Um, some of the purchasing of, of uh, cleaning and disinfecting materials and those kinds of things are eligible within the grant. There's also a way, and we're still studying this, that we might be able to use some of this money to, if the board approved, to establish a um, capital reserve, uh, which we don't have. And a capital reserve would enable you to have money set aside similar to the transportation bus purchase reserve that, to offer the community a uh, bond referendum that take the portion that is not aidable from the state and you use that money to reduce the local share cost of it. So it would have no, in, no tax impact. And that is a permissible, as I understand it, um, way to utilize this money because it's creating sustainability to upgrade your infrastructures uh, to, to address health and safety within your schools. We've got a, got a lot of brainstorming going on and I promise you we'll be spending this money wisely. In the, the temp, in the final posting, has to be on the website. Is that why the template's there to post it at some point? Is that a uh, requirement? Is there a requirement to like posting or public input? No. We will have to post our plan uh, okay. by July first okay. for public comment. The uh, the question I had too is is if if more members want to give input, you're going to send out the list and then we can kind of comment on that. Yes. I do think it's important, like you said earlier, Jeff, that the the um, scorecard and the district's objectives and goals need to drive the decision-making process around this. Right. So it's tied in directly with the needs of the district are. It is a lot of money. You know, want to use it wisely and be able to sustain some of the things that we should do. Great. Any other comments on this topic? We look forward to seeing that list. Pre-K planning, you know, we had money this year in the budget, uh, which was the funding from the state for pre-K. So we have been consulting with the state education department, as well as folks that reside in our community who work for the state, who oversee uh, pre-K programs, uh, specifically Head Start programs. Um, our allocation per student, I think it's $5,400 per student. That will cover 
100, 108 students total. Um, based on the discussions we've had so far, uh, we've requested some samples, RFPs that were issued to community-based providers, as well as contracts that have been approved between districts and community-based providers. And we're looking at those to, to explore what would be involved in an RFP. The more we learn about this, uh, the more we believe that contracting out through an RFP process to an agency that already does this, that has the curriculum in place, the supports in place, and has the space to provide it, would be the best way to go. In fact, I'm 95% certain that that would be my recommendation to the board. The advantage of that is we don't incur concerns about the sustainability of a district operated program in a district building, higher number of employees incur all of those um, obligations and then we don't know whether we're going to get the money next year. How it would work is similar to hiring the architect or hiring the auditors, board would have it put into the RFP document. Uh, we would send the RFP document out to any of the CBOs that are on the list of the state who are within the East Greenbush district. I think it has to be within the district. Does it not end up or operating program within the district? I believe it does. I'm not 100% sure of that. I'm not sure. Okay. They would have a deadline to respond to the RFP. There are standards established in the RFP, including the uh, use of New York State curriculum, appropriate class sizes, which are 18. 18.1.1, if you had a 19 student, student, you have to have 18.1.2. Um, uh, you know, uh, appropriate space for the classes, uh, appropriate staffing, uh, boarding mechanism back to the district, because we are ultimately responsible for overseeing it. So we can collect information, we can do site visits, the slots would be paid for by the district. So uh, we'll take, uh, we'll just call, I'll make up a name, uh, CBO number one. If they get the RFP and are awarded the RFP and they had uh, X number of slots uh, available, uh, we would pay for those slots through a contract. And there might be multiple CBA, CBOs on contract with the district because we could go up to 108 kids. And am I missing anything? Yeah, I think that is the main advantage of, of basically outsourcing this is that uh, we have an allocation of $5,400 per student up to 108 students. That's $583,200. So uh, the space issue uh, comes, to, comes into play. So if we outsource this to multiple locations, we may be able to fill the 108 spots. Whereas that may be, we may be restricted in district. And parents would have to participate in a lottery. And that lottery would go up to the number of slots that are available. And we cannot, and it is, it is uh, random. So for example, we cannot say we want X number. I don't believe we can say we have X number of slots to go to uh, families who live in Nassau or, or are served by DPS, it has to be completely random. So, or we want the same percentage of families across the five elementary school zones to have. We can't do that. We're not allowed by state rules to do it. It's the first 108 that get drawn in uh, and want to participate. Yes, completely random selection. So, do you have multiple CBOs? CBOs. How would that work then? If they're in different Geographic locations. I guess I guess something to talk about. Don't look at Keep it in But I think that's a it's a I mean I think that's the direction we should go in to provide the most opportunity for for the pre-K. It would be also, I think, the quickest way to get up and running with the yeah. program as opposed to setting up our own classroom and hiring our own teachers, our own teaching assistants. I would uh, like to see a board member or two involved with the RFP in the selection process. We, we're, we are interested in forming an early childhood 
Committee, this is one of the things that I'm going to start with. So if there is a board member that has, I will work around your schedules for the meetings, but um, if, if you are interested in general, contact me and we will get you a bell. I'm interested. Very good. Anybody else wants to participate? I'm interested. Okay. Right? Yep. Very good, John. We have all three of us. Okay. Excellent. Well, we'll have all three of you. Mike, Frank, and Michelle. All right. Very good. I'll let you know uh, sometimes the dates and see yeah. how it works for you. Excellent. Next item is the Bonadio contract extension. The first one on that one. Linda? Thank you. Uh, so we have had a contract with Bonadio for our uh, independent auditing services from 2015-16 school year through the 19-20 school year. Um, before you tonight is, um, for your consideration, is an extension, a one-year extension um, for the Bonadio group to complete the audit for the 2020-2021 school year, and then we will issue an RFP in the fall. Pretty straightforward. Any questions? <clears throat> why, why are we looking to extend for one year beyond the right to an RFP? Well, quite honestly, during the transition, it became later in the year. So um, the RFP process would have been too rushed to um, establish that in time for the audit this year. So technically their contract has expired right now. And Linda, how much um, increase was there? One thousand dollars. Did we did they ask us for a one year extension or are we asking them for a one year extension? We are asking them for a one year extension. Assuming they're interested? Yes. Just for one reason. Yes. You raised some valid points. I think the RFP will really tell us, I think, part of the process. I understand what you're doing. It's a troubling year, but if any organization or company is interested in business with us, and they say, hey, can you stay out for another year? That's all the way it is, and keep going. But say, yeah, absolutely. But we're going to raise our fee, not an RFP. <laughs> well, Mr. Mann, there are some additional uh, requirements this year. There is a GASB uh, requirement that we have to implement this year, which they will assist us with. Also, there um, is federal funding that they have uh, additional requirements on auditing. Any other comments or discussion? And this contract extension is, in, is going to be in regular business. Next slide, yes. And lastly, you mentioned earlier in the meeting, Jeff, the summer school. So I'm going to give uh, Mr. McHugh an opportunity to give a quick summary of the summer school program. Uh, it's really coming together nicely, and we do have a high interest. Uh, just a quick uh, summary. Uh, we put an initial survey out to all of our district families with children currently in uh, kindergarten through eighth grade to see the interest in participating in a four-week uh, regular education summer school program. The survey closed on May 3rd. The concern was that we only had a 48.9% participation. Uh, so we were a little nervous that 51% of our parents didn't respond to the survey. and We have to staff this program, which is a tremendous challenge right now. And once we got the ball rolling, we were afraid that we'd have a lot of parents that said, well, I wasn't aware, and that number would increase. So uh, we decided to send out a second survey that went out to just the parents that did not respond to the first survey. Uh, and uh, that survey uh, is listed within the document that was shared. 
uh, and uh, that survey closed on Friday, May 21st. So the numbers that were in that posted report are a little bit different. Um, I have that breakdown uh, of students. And again, that survey is closed. We were uh, very clear in our description of what the summer school program would be, that it was going to be in the K-5 focus, K going to grade one, grade one going to grade two, and so on, that that K-5 focus would be ELA and mathematics and that social emotional uh, component. And in the grades six through eight, it was the four core content areas, and again, the social emotional learning component. Uh, there was an internal posting in the district for a school principal, um, as well as a posting for general ed teachers to staff our summer school program. There was one applicant for the principal position, internal candidate with the, qual with the administrative uh, qualification. Uh, there were 16 internal candidates that uh, posted to work summer school. Six of those candidates also applied for the extended uh, school year program. So we really had 10, uh, 10 people apply. And uh, we really are looking at probably uh, 20 to 29 sections for summer school for, for K-8. So we have an external posting that's out uh, currently. Uh, in regards to Columbia High School, they will run their traditional APEX program. And typically, each year they see 50 to 80 students that participate in that APEX program. What is new is the uh, their summer enrichment program, which the goal for the high school is to bring 120 students, grades 9 through 12, in for that summer school enrichment program. And again, that will focus on the four core areas plus the arts, uh, and it will also have that social emotional learning component. So we post the first school social worker for each one of those uh, programs, uh, some teaching assistance to help logistically. What we are going to do is the time for the K-8 program will be 8.45 to 11.45 as the instructional day. That will allow the kids to participate in the extended 12-year, uh, 12-month 12 program to, to come into school, to get uh, settled in the classrooms, and then uh, we'll stagger that arrival and dismissal so we're not overlapping uh, logistically. We are funding as much of this program as we can through Questar so that we get the aid that we can get on it. Um, there is a collaboration piece for our teachers, which is really powerful. Uh, the workday for our teachers will be a four hour workday Tuesday through Friday. Mondays will be a five hour workday because they'll have one hour uh, in the afternoon for collaboration with other teachers. And they'll really dig into those standards. What are the what are those critical concepts? What are those critical standards that really need to get addressed um, during the summer to, to uh, bring kids up to speed and get them uh, give a little boost for um, the upcoming school year? The social emotional learning component, we want to do some universal, meaning that we want our social workers to push in to these sections and, and do some universal social emotional learning work with our students. And we'll also uh, continue with any kind of support services uh, that are small group or individual as well. Um, we are looking at those things that have been remote all year to help transition them back into the building. In order to participate within the Questar program, we need at least one student to participate in Questar's remote summer school program. So uh, they can either participate in the grades 9 through 12 Apex credit recovery remotely, or they can participate in uh, grades three through 12 um, remote summer school program. So uh, we're working on the, the next steps. If we get a uh, approval for our, our summer school principal, I will work with our summer school uh, principal to get a more formal communication out to the parents that stated they are interested in having their child participate and try to get a real firm commitment that the students are going to participate because that will drive our staff. Questions? Questions or comments on summer school? So good luck with the staffing piece. I know there's a lot, of, a lot of districts that are running summer school, and I think it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's challenging. You know, we're running our own extended school year program, but several of our kids do, and it's, it's challenging. 
to even get existing staff to want to work this summer because of the what happened over the past 15 months. Moving on, any more comments? Discussion? Moving on to regular business, the district voting results. Very pleased about those. Um, anyone to add, Jeff, to the no, I just want to again thank the community for their outpouring of support. Uh, positive vote result: eighty-seven percent on the budget, eighty-eight percent on the transportation uh, purchases. And I want to thank the board members who uh, uh, ran for the board again. And I want to thank our new board member from the community for being willing to serve on a voluntary basis, which are, uh, in a really great capacity as a school board member. So. Look forward to continuing to work with the board members, and again, I thank the community for um, the overall great result on our budget vote. And I want to specifically thank Linda Wager for all of her work uh, on the preparation of the budget and the preparation of the vote day, which is always you know, under wrecking. Excellent. Any any other comments regarding the, the budget vote results? Yes, yeah. you know, can I yes, just uh, add to that? There's a there's a couple of people too that I like to recognize and that is I'd like to publicly thank our election workers. Um, there are many that have returned year after year and we had a lot of new people this year so they really helped to make things go smooth. Uh, Maura Krispelik is our vote chairperson and uh, she really does oversee the day and she does an excellent job of that. I have to mention um, special thanks to Jeannie Pangburn, our district clerk and my secretary as well as Stephanie Jorgensen, uh, Mr. Simon's secretary. They really um, were my two right-hand people this year and really helped me uh, coordinate and um, and make sure things ran smoothly. So I do appreciate their, their uh, efforts as well. Thank you, Linda. I just want to say to the thank you community for the support. I, the board did try to find a very uh, strong budget that supports kids in, in learning and Achieving the, uh, the goal of uh, addressing academic gaps that may occur because of the pandemic. And uh, being in person, it was good to see. It turned out with a little lighter than usual, but we, we really want to thank the committee for coming out. Those who came out and voted in support of the budget, uh, we really appreciate it. We have uh, a lot of things planned for the for next year. With that, I need a uh, motion to approve the results. Frank, second, Michelle. All those in favor? Approved. For the program for prison children with disabilities. Any questions or comments there? Seeing none, need a motion to approve that. Jennifer, second. Joanne, all those in favor? Approved. We have the uh, school bus accident first reading policy. I like to change this. The policy committee uh, met to review a recommended recommendation for a new policy related to bus accidents. Historically, there have been procedures in place to uh, ensure that uh, students and anybody on the bus is evaluated and for potential injury. Uh, there was a need to clarify what those procedures were. Um, at one time, I think there was an expectation that school nurses could respond to the scene of an accident. Uh, that's very, uh, that creates a liability during the school day when uh, those nurses are serving children uh, and in the buildings. So we decided that in consultation with the police department, OC's health and safety, uh, Mr. Tucker, who serves in a safety capacity, uh, and um, our uh, administrative team, that we would, and Mark Noah, that we would require emergency services to be called in every instance. Uh, the original draft of the policy that was put together, and that volume draft was also instrumental in helping us put this together indicated that if there was one student on the bus, um, we should still call EMS. Uh, Mrs. Taylor, being conscientious, uh, indicated that she preferred the draft to say, even if there isn't a student on the bus, we should call uh, EMS to come and make an assessment of the driver. So we concluded that change, which was a good one. And we have everything spelled out in policy and regulation and procedures now, uh, so there should be no confusion. Very good. Any questions on the policy? First read. If you do, we'll get those to, to Jeff and the committee, and then we'll uh, we'll move that to second reading in the next meeting. Next item is the Bob Hill contract extension that Linda mentioned during the discussion. Any questions or comments? 
Need a motion to approve that? Michelle, second, John, those in favor? Those opposed? Seeing? Approved. The next is the engagement letter. Any questions or comments on the engagement letter? When the list of distinction between the engagement letter and the convention just spells out the Yes, the terms. engagement letter um, spells out uh, from the auditors exactly what their objectives are and the, their procedures uh, monitoring our, taking a look at our internal controls and testing those controls, as well as um, taking a look at our estimates that we make um, as far as pension liabilities, and um, we have an actuarial service that helps us with that. Uh, we also make estimates on our depreciation and the life of our equipment those types of things. That's what the engagement letter talks about and okay. how they'll perform their audit. Any questions for Linda? Seeing none, I uh, need a motion to approve the, the resolution for the engagement letter. Michelle, second. Jennifer, all in favor? Those opposed? Approved. Next we have our uh, committee reports. Marissa? Yes, Rina. Our attendance team Committee met on May 6th and also on May 11th. At our May 11th meeting, uh, we spoke about a draft compensation matrix. And myself, uh, Mr. McHugh, and Mrs. Taylor provided the PGTA with a draft matrix that was within the budgeted parameters of approximately $188,000. Um, we reviewed that matrix as a committee together. Uh, PGTA had um, provided their input and they were looking at a compensation matrix of around $217,000, uh, which is about $30,000 outside of the budget. We refocused our attention at that meeting specifically regarding the charge of the committee and what we have been tasked with, which is staying within those budgeted parameters and making sure we have uh, an equitable distribution of funds and fairly done. Um, I had asked the EGTA to take another look at their cost structure, uh, which they agreed to, and they provided us with their update on May 20th. We most recently met on Monday, May 24th as a committee, and um, it's a very positive meeting. Uh, both uh, Mr. Romanowski and Mrs. Hozier took uh, a very fair attempt at um, drafting a cost matrix. And right now, we are very close to being within the budgeted parameters. We're only about $4,000 apart. We um, spoke about some suggestions on where we could get into the budgeted parameters. And the only other thing on the table right now uh, for continued discussions are unpaid clubs. And we will be meeting again on June 10th. Does anyone have any questions regarding the committee minutes? No? No questions? Thank you, Marissa. Appreciate the work on that. Thank you. Thank you. We're close. Plus. Okay. Before the end of the year? Before the end of the year. Okay. Here's for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Linda? Thank you. Uh, the Finance and Audit Committee met on May 13th, and that the purpose of that was to review the engagement letter with our independent auditors. Um, we went through, as I said earlier, auditor responsibilities, our management responsibilities, and how the audit will be conducted and when it will be conducted, which is the third week in August. And uh, we also had our internal auditor, Michael Wolf, present at the meeting. He will be beginning uh, his risk assessment um, actually tomorrow. He'll be here tomorrow and Friday, and um, he'll also be back in June uh, to, to finish that work. And just finally, um, I wanted to recognize Mrs. Alyssa Blaustein, who has been a member of the Finance and Audit Committee meeting since 2014, and she'll be stepping away after this year as her son is graduating from Columbia High School, so she'll be moving on to other things, but she has really been um, a, a main uh, contributor to our committee for a few years now. Any questions for Linda? No? Very good. Thanks, Linda. Jim, you have several items on your committee uh, list here. I will spare you professional <laughs> development that uh, 
May 3rd. Uh, there is the 2021-22 Professional Deve Development Plan. That will be on the June 9th uh, board agenda for superintendent's report discussion item. CCS met on May 5th. Special Education and Related Services Program review was presented. That will probably come to the board at some point in July. And the Education Committee met on May 10th. We had a very uh, rich discussion regarding our graduation rate and looking at our non-completers over the last five years. And that data is attached as well. Any questions? A lot of great information and analysis and graduation rate. The boss keeps me busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes the way you characterize things, Mr. McHugh, was not exactly the way I did it. <laughs> Mr. McHugh did an extensive dropout analysis. I just want to talk about it a little bit. John, when we looked at our graduation rate, um, I actually exceeded expectations because I challenged Mr. McHugh to look at it kid by kid. Who were the kids that dropped out? over the last five cohorts, uh, what was the profile of those kids, what were some of the issues that they were challenged by, and I wanted to know. Uh, and uh, Jim went even further than that and did um, an extensive review so that we could see some of the characteristics of the kids and what happens in some cases, so, uh, and what some of the challenges. So we could do a better job of intervening at various stages as we follow the kids up in track. So Jim, Jim did a super job at that. The way he presented it to the committee must I didn't quite say the numbers aren't good enough, but uh, I do appreciate your advocacy for the kids and looking at what we can do to prevent dropouts. Jim, I have to say that was excellent. The analysis was great. Do we see changes in how we handle things policy-wise, like, like Jeff said, on trying to help prevent? I see 10th grade as a big dropout period. Like, could we focus a little bit on the 10th graders and see what we could do to help stop that. Um, I, you know, I don't know what kind of ideas we're having for maybe future. Well, you know, it was just a, right, first you present the data, let people digest it a little bit, respond to it. Uh, it's sensitive a little bit because we own that data. We have a 97% graduation rate. So there's a lot of positives to focus on and a lot of success stories. And I can tell you that our uh, faculty and our our Support services, they go above and beyond. There were some interesting trends that I just will speak to briefly. Uh, a lot of those students, when we looked at our 38 students that were that did not complete, uh, interesting enough, there was uh, just shy of a half dozen uh, students that were academically uh, performing excellent. They were the A student, high flyer, and uh, all of a sudden the typical trend of uh, attendance, chronic absenteeism and they just fall off. So those are students that wouldn't identify and present as an at-risk student for any other reason. There was no behavior problem. There was uh, nothing on the radar. High flyers that they just uh, stopped. So uh, opens up a, a huge discussion. Just for example, uh, this school year dealing with COVID pandemic have been, has been a tremendous challenge, but. Uh, is there is there a need for a, a, a student that may be able to get through that time with a with a remote format, even past the COVID pandemic? Uh, what I will say is we do a really good job in our high school, uh, especially does a great job of getting kids in the right program. There were several cases where the students were placed in an alternate education program. For example, CTAP. And, they, and it was a complete turnaround. They went from failing multiple courses to passing all of their courses and then refused the placement and then things went south. Uh, there's a large number of students that are transients, meaning that they enter uh, our district maybe in the middle school or the high school. There's in, you know, what I really did was I, I kind of did a biography on each one of those students and collected as much data, even if they were ours from kindergarten, as much data as I could uh, find on them. Uh, but, you know, there's a situation, there's several situations where students were having really challenging issues in another district, whether it was their social circle, uh, whether they became disengaged, and 
Alaska Shepherd. Parents relocate to another school district, enroll, and try to give them a fresh start. A lot of times that hole is just too big for a student to get out of. They just they lose that hope, and uh, that's a problem. problem. So I want to emphasize the fact that our 97% graduation rate, and I'll go on record saying this, would not be where it is without CTAP, without Operation Graduation, without Columbia's alternate program, without MAP, without Jumpstart, uh, and without you know faculty and administration going the extra mile for kids. We've, we've provided tutoring to students during this time to bridge that gap. Are there things that we can do uh, to improve? There are. It's a sensitive subject because it, when you talk about the non-completers over five years being 38, people aren't hearing all the success stories of all the kids that walked across that graduation stage and graduated because of the extra effort. So um, it was that initial presentation of the data that people uh, you know, look at it for a little while and think about it and then pick up that discussion again, because there, there are things, and those are the things that we're looking at right now, like for example, expanding math down to grade six. It is those transitional years where students really struggle, elementary to the middle school, middle school to the high school. So those are things that we're looking at currently uh, to put in place for next year. Yeah, I think it's really important to distinguish the graduation rates and to, I mean, you look at every trend, there were right on top. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it felt like a black rain cloud at Education Committee because I presented that data and, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard when it's right in front of you, right? But, you know, the fact that some students aren't even on our radar, they're just high flyers academically, not presenting, having any issues at all, but for some reason, uh, you know, stop coming to school. If you dig a little deeper, there's some mental health concerns in there. So, you know, we've made a, we've made a tremendous effort to, to really, uh, provide that professional development and really talk about some things that are difficult to talk about. But every student matters and, you know, uh, Mr. Sonny Smith hold me to task to really take a deep look at that. So those are all great questions and it's a great discussion. The truth is I mentioned an issue and Jim takes it and runs with it, which is a great thing. He does a great job on it. So. And, uh, and I appreciate the effort, Jim. Because we can, we can do things, Michelle, that focus on some of those difficult transition years and we can develop a system to track those kids as they move from elementary to middle school to high school to have those indicators that early on they might be um, in jeopardy of not graduating. And, and those, that's the next conversation that Jim says we're going we're gonna to have with folks now that we... Just, just real quick, one thing that came right out of that is when we have a new student that transfers in, we talked about a mentor. We talked about you know, uh, making sure that we're checking on that student that transitioned in, right? Like instantly giving them that trusted adult and establishing that connection in school to help monitor that student's transition into our district. So that's an instant, that, that, that's an instant doable. I think as we, um, as the team works together and we, we as a board get together for board retreat and discussion about our goals and objectives and scorecard meeting those conversations in to make sure that this kind of data, we love to see more conversations about this at the board level so the committee can hear more about it. Um, that's like just the education committee and some comments the committee level because it is so important about these success stories and all the efforts that we make to not only provide, like you said, with Questar was here, the opportunities for, for programs and it's also the opportunities for children and families who struggle and get them back on track. It's those investment in those programs to get them across the finish line so they can be successful as well. Next can you report? Um, Jeff. I'm going to be giving a general overview, brief overview. Uh, our committee on global education has met recently. Uh, this is a committee that is focused on diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, we've been meeting for over a year and a half now or so. Recently, the State Education Department came out with a policy document and a toolkit and guidance resource guide related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We discussed that within our committee. The way that that document is organized from the state level is very similar to the way we organized our planning within our committee. Uh, so uh, the committee has agreed to use the state's resources to develop a written plan 
Uh, we're focusing on areas of professional development. We have a number of opportunities that are coming up uh, next year, as well have been offered online this year. We're also looking at ways that we can assess our curriculum to make sure that we are avoiding any type of bias within our curriculum. Uh, additionally, we are uh, looking at ways that we can welcome families that are new to the district through an ambassador program. Uh, and uh, we've identified people within each building who can serve in those roles. So if a new family moves in, as I'm familiar with East Greenbush, that we help them transition to know uh, how to access information, uh, who to go to within the school district, but also within the community. Uh, so that, that committee is continuing to work. Uh, there's a book study currently uh, happening among a subgroup of that committee. One of the ideas that flew, flowed out of that meeting uh, came from John, and John, I don't know if you want to speak to it, but we're, we're looking to revamp our website uh, under the area of community and to really have a community resources website. So you can go on the district website and you know where to go for what in the capital region. Uh, and have it be more reflective of the diversity of the resources that are available here. And it's something that I've talked to Mark Adam about, and he's uh, working on that behind the scenes. Just to, to add to that, one of the things that we talked about at that level was the school districts, in, especially in this region, is five towns. So we are the center of a lot of activity, and we're attracting a lot of people, the businesses from all over. And we kind of assume that people when you go to register your kid for school, it's a very sterile process. And we wanted to make it a more personal process so that use our website and our tools to not only give people information that you don't have to um, really search for and also identify resources to help people transition into the community, whether um, the language resources, which is a, is a really big thing right now. And, and it doesn't have to mean we refer them to the district for a language resource, but there might be a community group. And I always think of one particular group of students my wife had, they were Ukrainian. And uh, there was three girls that came at high school level and they spoke no English. And it was through the resources of a Ukrainian church and co-host through an employee that we got them plugged into people that they could communicate with and we could also identify with translators and different things like that. And I just, in, in our conversation, a lot of times the focus is what um, is different about people, but using our resources to what is our real common interest. And our common interest is students and families and, and, and success. And I, I, I think it's a great project overall. Thank you, John. We're also working on policies and procedures. Uh, Marissa is the chair of that group and they're looking at ways to make sure that the code of conduct is inclusive and uses uh, appropriate references. I'll talk about that. So our code of conduct committee met last week and um, Joanne Taylor and Jennifer Massey were on that committee meeting. Um, it was very positive, um, especially with our two student representatives. Um, they were very happy to see that we are going to be adding inclusive language and um, collaboration language within that code of conduct to make sure that all you know ethnic groups and all of our diverse employees and our students and our community members are reflected within that code. Thank you. We also have been meeting with our district's advocacy committee, but we've expanded participation in, in that committee to for the last two meetings. We've invited representatives from other districts, superintendents and Questar representatives, because we are planning a very important advocacy forum, which will be a regional effort on June 2nd from 7.30 to 9. It will be a virtual forum focused on school, full school opening in September. Uh, Mark Adam has worked with me to put together uh, a uh, very uh, comprehensive schedule for that evening. We've consulted with uh, Dan Sherman from Bosies, uh, who's the Director of Communications. We have representatives from more than just our district assigned to speaking roles, including two 
two students from our district, a board member from another district, myself, Dr. Cruz, uh, and we're trying to communicate the need for all of the kids to be back full time and for us to have the guidance now of how they want us to accomplish that. We've invited all of our state elected representatives. We've heard back from some of them in Jake Ashby, who has, was the first to respond. The Commissioner of Education, Betty Rosa, has committed to attending that as one of the panelists. We've invited uh, the county executives of the respective counties within Questar to attend uh, as well so they can hear the dialogue. And we think it will be a very informative uh, program. All of the parents, students, community members uh, are welcome to attend it because it's virtual. Uh, you can attend it through the live stream. And again, we're hoping that that will lead to well, the governor said this week that he would anticipate that schools would be fully open. That's a good sign, but we want to make sure that we know uh, that's going to happen for sure. And we want to be able to put our plans together based on whatever guidance we need uh, to be ready in September. And uh, so I think it'll be an overall team effort on the part of our component districts within the West Star. We sent out uh, an invitation to the parents uh, this week, and uh, we'll be sending reminders out, and I will be calling our elected representatives who haven't responded yet to make sure that they're aware of it, and hopefully they can attend. Safety committee met uh, on May 14th. Uh, we talked about the climate survey that was done. Uh, we want to present that survey to the board, likely at our last meeting in June so that the public is aware that when we did the survey in the fall, we did look at the results, study the results through the safety committee, and we are very pleased with the results, but we will also have some goals and objectives for further improvement that we'll present to the board uh, on June 23rd. And I think that covers all my committees. Any questions for Jeff? Yes. Deborah? Any update on the um, presentation to the county legislature on the bus? Yes. Did that occur on Friday? Yes, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to Mark on that. Let's Mark organize that. So, thank you. We, uh, we did have a very good meeting with the, uh, the majority of the county legislatures were on the uh, virtual meeting, um, uh, as well as representatives from the town of East Greenbush and the Greenbush Police Department. South Jeff, Mark North. So it worked out very well. The county was very supportive of it. Um, they, they've actually drafted up county law already, you know, legislation that they shared with us. Um, Kelly Hoffman and Tom Grant were really uh, taking the leads on it. And Asked some questions to the company that were answered. Uh, you know, we asked some questions. To, uh, Jeff asked some questions. Jack Conway from the town asked some questions, and you know, all the answers were provided. Everybody was was pretty happy, pretty satisfied with with the program, with the services, you know, what they offer. So, um, hopefully, we'll hear from the county here. You know, I, I ended it with saying that. The balls in their court, you know, that you know, uh, district you know, was interested, the town of East Greenwich Police Department is interested in it, um, you know, ball, balls in the county's court. You know, so I uh, actually emailed them tonight saying, hey, thanks for joining in. You know, what's, your, what's your next process now? So you can, you can stay on top of it. Uh, I know Jeff is going to send a letter. Yes. Jack Conway is going to send a letter um, to the legislatures uh, saying, hey, we support this. You know, let's, let's, let's move forward with it. So it seemed pretty well. Thanks, Mark. Any other comments or questions for committees? Very good. Uh, next item is table motions. I don't have anything. 
Stunning. All business. Okay. Okay. Moving on to the uh, consent agenda. Items A through I. Any questions or comments regarding those agenda items? Those consent agenda items. If not, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Joanne, second. Jennifer, all those in favor? Approved. Uh, no addendums. Any new business board members? Okay. Moving to our second public forum. Linda, do we have any indications? No Thank you. Uh, our second board forum. I'll start my right with Frank. Anything? No. Joanne? Mark? John? Good. Michelle? Sure. Good. Jennifer? I don't have anything. Just again, want to thank the committee for the support of the budget. Um, looking forward to the next few weeks as there's a lot of activities for our, our students and families. Looking forward to a successful elevations and graduation. Participating in those activities as well. So, with that, we do need a uh, executive session for purposes of personnel contractual items. We don't just need board business after the executive session. So, I need a motion to approve. Going into executive session. Michelle, second. Frank, that was in favor. All right. I want to thank everyone in the uh, virtual world for attending, and uh, we'll see you uh, next quarter. Thank you.